most students of general relativity rarely get beyond the two-body problem. But in recent years, uh, dealing with general relativity and the n-body problem, where n is larger than 2, has become an increasingly interesting and important uh, problem in physics. In some sense, actually, however, the in intersection between general relativity and the n-body problem probably started in the 19th century. In 1859, Jean-Joseph Robin Le Verrier pointed out that there was a problem with the orbit of Mercury. Um, Verrier have, had, of course, known about this problem for almost 15 years. But in the early part of that period, he was just a young guy with no, no status and was afraid to publish it because it was so controversial. Along the way, however, Le Verrier pointed out that if you look at the orbit of Uranus, small deviations in that orbit could be explained if there was an additional planet out beyond the orbit of Uranus. A few days after he pointed this out and sent to messages across Europe, astronomers in Berlin found this planet, subsequently to be called Neptune. So by 1859, Le Verrier was famous. He had tenure. He was the director of the Paris Observatory. And so he felt confident to point out this additional problem uh, obtained simply by solving or working out the n-body problems using standard perturbation theory. What he did was to calculate the effect on Mercury's perihelion of all the other planets in the solar system using the standard Lagrange planetary equations that had been worked out and were a well-known machinery in his day. So uh, Venus contributes 277 arc seconds per century, Earth 90, Mars, so on, Jupiter a big amount because though it's further away, it's much more massive, it contributes a lot, Saturn 7.3, you add them up and you get 531 arc seconds which disagreed with the observed amount of 575. The difference was in modern language 42 arc seconds per century. Now at the time Le Verrier and many of his colleagues proposed following the logic of, Ur of Uranus and Neptune, that this could be explained if there was an additional planet between Mercury and the Sun. They even gave this planet a name, Vulcan, after the Roman god of fire, because it would, of course, have to be very hot. This illustrates that, maybe for the first time, how brilliant physicists are in giving names to things about which they know absolutely nothing. <laughs> a modern version might be dark energy, for example. <laughs> Of course, we all know how this resolved itself. In 1915, armed with his equations from general relativity, Einstein included the additional perturbations produced by the modifications of the law of gravity uh, from relativity and found uh, 42.9 arc seconds per century. Again, these are the modern values that resolved that discrepancy. Indeed, how accurately did the very just I think it was like it was on the order of 40, maybe 30 or so. I don't know. 40 plus or minus 10. And even as late as, the, as the, uh, you know, the turn of the 20th century, it was sort of 40 plus or minus 8 or 9. It was not known well. Um, but Einstein got it close enough that he you know, said he was ha thought he was having a heart attack when he finished the calculation and, and got this result. Of course, here are the modern values armed with uh, information on all the planets, better orbits and better masses of the planets, so you can calculate these effects much more accurately, plus data on the motion of Mercury. And in fact, recently this, these observations have gotten better, mainly through Mercury Messenger, the, the orbiters of Mercury that have given modern, improved data points on Mercury's orbit that have improved the accuracy tremendously. So the known discrepancy is now at the level of five parts in 10 to the five. And of course, in complete agreement with the prediction of general relativity. In fact, it's ironic that this error now is comparable to the error in our knowledge of the solar oblateness. And given, speaking in Princeton, uh, given that years ago the claim by Dickey that the solar oblateness was you know, 500 times larger than the now known value, we're now at the level of worrying about the error in the solar oblateness that's been inferred from helioseismology. So soon, one may have to really combine a lot of other stuff just to check this agreement with GR. Well, this is just the influence of n bodies on the two-body problem. And what I want to do today is talk about, uh, at least end up with the inverse question. What is the influence of general relativity on the evolution of n body systems? So I'll begin with uh, another example of a two-body problem that I worked on a while ago that was really the thing that got me sucked into this whole field about which I know literally nothing. Um, I'll talk about what I call the quadrupole conundrum, which led me to think about the idea that one may need to include certain kinds of post-Newtonian corrections in the n-body equations of motion that I call cross terms, and I'll explain what they are. 
And then I'll describe two specific uh, contexts in which these kinds of uh, post-Newtonian terms might be relevant. Uh, central black holes inside a, a dense star cluster and hierarchical triple systems. And then I'll make some final uh, remarks. I'm sorry? Well, that, well that, that's all he did. I mean, he, and he got, I mean, he, he, had, the, he had the right post Newtonian. He, that, that's a modern terminology for it, but he, he had all the right terms from GR to get the right answer. Higher order corrections just produce a very small effect. Uh, I think you have to go factor of 10 in error before you start getting post post Newtonian terms. No, but he had, he had all the right. Uh, all the right terms in his equations. Another two-body problem where you, uh, ultimately you have to worry about perturbations from other stars has to do with uh, counting hair at the galactic center. A few years ago, I suggested that you might be able to test the no hair theorems of general relativity by carefully tracking the orbits of uh, certain kinds of stars orbiting the galactic center black hole in Sag star. If you have a, a, a body orbiting a, a, a rotating black hole, there are three kinds of effects that are generated by the black hole's space time. The first, of course, is the standard uh, pericenter precession within the plane of the orbit. Uh, it's determined by this formula. M is the mass of the black hole. A, the semi major axis. E, the eccentricity. This, of course, is the same formula that governs the advance of Mercury's perihelion. And that just produces a pericenter in the plane and generated by the, the Schwarzschild part of the rotating black hole's metric, the, just the mass. But because the black hole is rotating, it also causes the dragging of inertial frames. And so its angular momentum also generates orbital perturbations. These are smaller than the mass perturbation by a, a half power of this small factor, m over a, and by the ratio of j to m squared, which for a Kerr black hole is always less than one. The maximum this quantity can be is one. I'm using units in which G and C are unity. So it's a smaller effect. But notably, uh, the frame dragging can induce an additional pericenter advance. But more importantly, it induces a precession of the orbital plane. Basically, the line of nodes precesses around the spin axis of the black hole. Or as seen on the sky, it causes a precession of both the inclination and the line of nodes relative to the plane of the sky. Now, rotating black hole also has a quadrupole moment, and that also induces precessions proportional to another half power of this small parameter, so it's smaller still. And by the quadrupole moment, which according to general relativity, and this idea embodied in the no hair theorems, is uniquely given by this formula, j squared over m. Black holes have no hair, or technically black holes have two hairs, angular momentum and mass, and once you know those two all the rest of the space time, all the multiple moments are determined in terms of those two parameters. So once you've measured those two, you've uniquely specified the black hole. So the idea of this test is to measure Q and J. Uh, we know M already and see if that formula holds. This quadruple effect also induces an additional pericenter precession, but it, in addition, it induces a precession of the orbital planes. So the idea here is that if you could see two stars orbiting the central black hole and measure the precessions of their orbital planes, you have four measured quantities, the two variations in the inclination, two variations in the line of nodes on the plane of the sky. That allows you to measure the four unknown quantities, the two angles of the angular momentum vector and the magnitudes of J and Q. If you measure these two, you can test the no hair theorems. Now, what would it take to make this kind of measurement? We know there are these so-called S stars orbiting a black hole. They're too far away for uh, these effects to be observable. So what would it take? Obviously, small semi-major axis, high eccentricity, and a reasonably rapidly rotating black hole with J over M squared you know, of, of some reasonable size. So for example, if you have a black hole rotating at least half of its possible maximal uh, spin, stars with an orbital period of, uh, say, a tenth of a year or within a milliparsec of the black hole, so this is well within the S stars. High eccentricity, say 0.9, then the precessions as seen from Earth in the orbital planes of these stars would be at the levels of tens of micro arc seconds per year for the smallest effect, the quadrupole effect. These, of course, would be bigger. So if you can do this kind of astrometry to this accuracy, and if, if you can discover stars with these parameters, 
then you have a chance of testing the no-hair theorems. Now, this, is quite, this seems like quite a challenge, this kind of astrometry at the galactic center. But this level of astrometry is the stated goal of projects like gravity, the upgrade of the VLTI, headed by uh, uh, Reinhard Genzel and Frank Eisenhower in, in, in Munich, and the upgrade of the Keck interferometers, headed by Andrea Gez and her group at UCLA. So they have this kind of astrometry is something they would like to achieve. Put differently, when I told Andrea that this was what you would take to measure the, uh, to do this test, she did not fall out of her chair laughing hysterically. Okay, so I, I took that as a good sign that maybe this was not uh, a hopeless kind of task. Of course, you have to discover stars orbiting 10 times closer to the black hole than the current S stars that will require extra sensitivity, but that's also the kind of goal that they hope to achieve with these upgrades here. And by the way, pulsars would also do the trick. I don't care how you measure the orbital precessions, whether it's by astrometry of stars or by Doppler shifts of pulsars. You find a millisecond pulsar orbiting that close to the black hole, that would also work. And people like uh, um, uh, Kramer and, and others uh, who, who study pulsars have looked at the possibility of what it would take to, to measure millisecond pulsars if you could find them that close. The thing about this, of course, is if there's a cluster of stars orbiting that close to the black hole, then there's a cluster of stars orbiting black close to the, that close to the black hole. And each star is going to perturb everyone else. And so you worry that the stellar perturbations are going to simply wipe out any relativistic effect. And this is, of course, what got me sucked in to uh, David Merritt's orbit and dealing with n-body simulations. No, t tens of micro arc seconds per year yeah, as, as seen from Earth, you know, projected uh, to, to the Earth. So tough, but according to these people, not impossible. And of course, with short orbital periods, you get lots of uh, some integration time to, to build up these kinds of secular advances. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've figured it out in, in, the plane, in, the, in the frame of the orbit. It's something I can't, don't know it offhand, but then. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, what about all the other, what about these stars that are also orbiting around? You want enough stars that you have a chance of seeing some uh, so close, but those other stars will perturb. So both with David Merritt, Tal Alexander, and Seppo Mercola, we did some in-body simulations to investigate this. I also did some semi-analytic work with my graduate student, Lali Sadigian. So here's a sample of the kinds of results that, that we got. So imagine a cluster, in this case, of, of 22 objects, 10 stars, and 11 10 solar mass black holes. We did a whole range of possible uh, uh, central clusters, all within four milliparsecs. This is inside the uh, S2 star. Um, the typical you know, um, definition of the distribution in, in orbital elements here just for an extremal black hole just to fix some numbers. And the kind of result that we obtained was that if you have a star within uh, be less than 0.2 milliparsecs from the black hole, so very close, then the quadrupole effect, these are, this is the angle, the number of stars whose perturbation due to J is, is at some value. So the perturbations due to J are quite large, due to Q are large, and they all rise above perturbations due to the stars. So in this case, you could measure both Q and J, and these solid curves are for eccentricities larger than 0.9. So the higher the eccentricity, the better, the bigger the effect. So for stars very close, you might be able to really measure both these parameters, and the stellar perturbations would be kind of noise uh, affecting your overall error. But of course, as you look at stars closer, uh, further away, the relativistic effects go this way, get smaller, and the stellar perturbations go that way and get bigger. So here, say between 0.2 and 0.5 milliparsecs, you could probably only me measure uh, J, the angular momentum of the black hole. But measuring J and its direction would, I would think, have non be of non-trivial astrophysical interest. Right? What is the, what, what's the direction of the spin of that black hole at the galactic center, and what is its value? That would be an interesting measure in its own right, but you would not get the quadrupole moment. As further out, 0.5 to 0.1, you could, might be able to measure J for, a, for eccentric orbits, but you, you're really killed there. And then out to the range of the S stars, the relativistic effects are simply too small to be measurable, and the stellar perturbations are too huge. I'm sorry? Is 
Um, so these are all orbiting the central black hole. Um, and, uh, and these stars are quite far apart. I mean, they're, they're four, four, uh, milli four milliparsecs away from the black hole, so it's a pretty undense system. So I would think stellar winds would not have a big effect on their perturbations. They just don't get close enough to each other to, to sense that. And the other thing is that um, you know, there, is, there's, there is an accretion disk, a very weak accretion disk around the central black hole, but the question is if that, the amount of mass in that accretion disk is probably not enough to affect orbits. There's un undoubtedly a distribution of dark matter near that galactic center black hole with a rise in density, but as long as that distribution is spherically symmetric, and it should be at first order, then that won't affect the orbital planes of planets. It's only the non-spherical perturbations that will change the orbital planes of these stars. Yeah, well, sure, right, yeah. So that, uh, and that would be almost an unknowable, unmodelable effect. Okay, so this, here, this again is really an example of bodies in an n-body system impacting a two-body problem where relativity is important. But of course, there's been a lot of work recently on using relativity, uh, incorporating relativity in a way to see how it might affect uh, n-body systems. So for example, uh, I think following up on work by Hoffman and Alexander, uh, we, and I say we in the loosest sense, I'm a relativist, they do the work, they're the real n-body experts, um, looked at, way that pericenter precession uh, induced by the black hole suppresses the torques that lead to uh, resonant relaxation and the production of emrys. These are extreme mass ratio in spirals that can produce gravitational waves important for LISA. And I just want to show two simulations from two uh, visualizations from these things just to illustrate this effect. I'm sure many of you know this effect quite well. So the perturbations due to other stars orbiting the central black hole typically cause the eccentricity to perform a random walk. This is one minus E, so this is highly eccentric. This is circular without changing the semi-major axis very much because there's little change in the energy of orbits unless you have a three-body encounter. So these orbits tend to move in a kind of random walk in, in eccentricity space, but every once in a while one gets into such, a, such an eccentric orbit that it gets close enough to the black hole to be either captured or to be in spiral due to gravitational wave damping. So every once in a while, one of these stars you'll see disappear and taken out of the simulation because it's been captured. And with simulations like this, you can then estimate the rate of production of stars that orbit eccentrically around a black hole close enough to emit gravitational waves that would be detectable by a space detector like LISA. So you can estimate the rate this way. However, if you include general relativity, and may, mainly the pericentric precession of each orbit induced by a general relativity, you find that there's a barrier to capture by the black hole. The barrier is defined by this line, and you'll see. I, I stopped it accidentally. You'll see stars come up to this barrier and be reflected. This is the barrier whereby the uh, time scale for pericentric precession is comparable to, to the time scale for this resonant relaxation effect, the torquing due to other stars. Roughly speaking, the orbit precesses so much that it gets out of the, the phase space of the stars that are perturbing it, trying to make it more eccentric. It sees other stars that are perturbing it in a different direction. Every once in a while, one will get through, and you'll see this one suddenly go zoom as radiation reaction circularizes it and decreases its semi-major axis, and it's captured by the black hole. But this Schwarzschild barrier turns out to strongly suppress the rate of formation of emery. So here's an example where general relativity, uh, even though it's an extremely weak effect for a given star, these are far away from the black hole, because of this long time scale of integration has a significant effect on the kind of collective phenomenon that produces uh, stars that could get close to the black hole. But in the course of doing this work, with, the, with Merritt, Alexander, and uh, Nicola, we discovered a, uh, an issue. In the simulations, there were a class of orbits of stars, highly eccentric orbits, highly inclined relative to the uh, equatorial plane of the spinning black hole. Here, some of these simulations had a black hole with a quadrupole moment and with a frame dragging. We had all those, those terms that were in the equations of motion. 
so stars inclined relative to that equatorial plane of the black hole experienced anomalously large variations in their semi-major axis. Large enough to, th to, to make uh, us wonder whether there would be significant evolutionary consequences of this, uh, you know, whether this would really affect the evolution of the system. Were these n-body effects? No, you turn off all the n-body perturbations, these oscillations persist. Was it due to the frame dragging? No, you turn off frame dragging, these oscillations persist. Was it due to the quadrupole moment? Well, you turn off quadrupole moment and the effect disappears. So it was really due to the quadrupole moment of the black hole and it was a two-body effect. Okay, so this is the simplest of all problems. Uh, one body orbiting a very massive body with a quadrupole moment, but also including the general relativistic pericenter precession. This is a problem that I can solve. That's a two-body problem. That's, that's right up my alley. And so I tried to think about what could account for these variations. If you think about it, um, Here's the, here's the problem. Here's the conundrum that you get when you try to contemplate this problem. Imagine a body in an eccentric orbit inclined relative to the equatorial plane of an object that is basically has a mass, has a quadrupole moment that's going to all be treated in Newtonian fashion, but you also include the standard pericenter precession of general relativity. We know in such a system the energy is conserved. The dynamics of that problem, Newtonian with a quadrupole moment and the post-Newtonian terms, there's a conserved energy given by the Newtonian energy, the quadrupole energy, and a post-Newtonian term, I haven't shown it, depends only on A and E. That energy is constant. But the quadrupole energy should change with time as the pericenter precesses. As the orbit moves from there to there, this term should change, and it makes a lot of sense because the quadrupole interaction energy when the orbit is like this, when it spends some time here in the northern hemisphere and is very close here in the southern hemisphere, that energy should be very different than the interaction energy with the quadrupole in this orientation where this eccentric orbit basically lies in the orbital plane, a little bit above and a little bit below. Two very different interaction energies, and so this should change with time as the pericenter precession. The trouble is, Energy is constant. In this problem, it's trivial to show that A is constant, I is constant, and E is constant. So everything here is constant except omega, which is varying. So something has to give. Energy is conserved. Everything else is constant but omega. What has gone wrong? Well, maybe A must vary in order to compensate for this. So I had to think about how do you resolve this conundrum? You resolve it by going back to those equations of motion that include the mass, quadrupole moment, and relativity. The actual equations of motion look like this. The first post-Newtonian order, uh, acceleration is gradient of the Newtonian potential, and then there are these uh, relativistic corrections, and they'll always be governed by 1 over c squared. So if you see that, you, you know that's a post-Newtonian correction. The potential is just the mass term plus the quadrupole term. So when you plug that potential into these equations of motion, you get a number of different kinds of terms. You get the Newtonian term, just from plugging that into there. You get the Newtonian quadrupole term by plugging that into there. You get the post-Newtonian corrections by plugging this into these terms. But you also get some cross terms, terms that are proportional to delta, which is, is governed by Q, and epsilon, which is the post-Newtonian part. These terms come when you plug the quadrupole part of the potential into these post-Newtonian terms. So I call these cross terms because they're not pure uh, GR and they're not pure quadrupole, but they're a mixture of the two effects. So now you solve the orbital perturbation equations. You have, a, say, for, for the semi-major axis, the ADT is a, has three terms. There's a uh, post-Newtonian term, which is a, these are the Lagrange planetary equations, the quadrupole term, and this cross term. But now when you want to solve these equations, normally you integrate over time over one orbit and look for the secular growth of any orbital element. And generally speaking, you set each of these con orbital elements equal to a constant and then just integrate over an orbit. But that would not be correct because each orbital element has its own periodic perturbations, one induced by the post-Newtonian term, one induced by the quadrupole term. And so you really need to plug these variations into these orbital elements because that will generate terms of the same order as the cross terms that you're, that you're keeping. 
And similarly, you have to plug these variations within these periodic variations induced by the quadrupole into the post-Newtonian terms, because those will generate potentially secular terms of the same order as those you're looking for. And then you can integrate over uh, one orbit. If you want to do analytic work, it's often convenient to integrate over the true anomaly of the orbit rather than time. But even there, you can't use the simple formula that d by dt is the angular momentum over r squared times d by d phi. You have to include these additional terms. Where do these come from? They come from the fact that t is measured from a fixed moment of time, whereas the true anomaly is measured from the uh, pericenter, which itself changes with time due to the pericenter advance and to the motion of the angle of nodes. So the relation between these two is more complicated than the first order one. And here, you can also get cross terms because each GR and the quadruple term generate contributions here that then will fold into these expressions. So you, it's like doing second order perturbation theory. You really have to carefully include uh, all these corrections properly. When you do that, you discover that there is a variation in the semi-major axis. It's of this mixed order, epsilon times delta. It's a relativistic quadrupole effect. Now, if you ask, how does this evolve over a pericenter precession time scale? So we just integrate over uh, a long time scale. You can convert that integral over time into integral over omega, divide by dividing by omega dot. And notice what happens. Omega dot is the pericenter relativistic precession. So you have a term that's of order epsilon delta, but over a pericenter precession time scale, you divide by epsilon. And so you get something that becomes of Newtonian, effectively in Newtonian order. And the answer is that A grows with a Newtonian amplitude, and it depends on omega. And this variation in A is exactly what you need to compensate for the variation in omega in the quadrupole term. If you plug that in, you then get something that depends only on uh, the values of these orbital elements at the initial moment of time, and energy is conserved. But you would not get it if you did not include these cross-term deviations in the semi-major axis. Now, you remember I told you that what started this off was we found that there was these anomalous uh, variations in the semi-major axis of orbits with high inclination that varied at twice the uh, pericenter angle. And here's the formula that, that you get from this calculation. Trouble is, the amplitude of this thing did not agree with what we were getting from the numerical simulation. They disagreed by quite a large amount. So what was wrong? After some investigation, we realized that Seppo Mercola in the codes was using Newtonian theory and the post-Newtonian terms just from the monopole. Because who knew? As soon as we added those quadrupole mixed terms into his code, the variations in A agreed exactly with this analytic calculation. So you know, both from an analytic point of view and a, a numerical point of view, including these cross terms is, is necessary if you want to get the conserved quantities to be properly conserved. And the amplitudes that you get here are not so anomalously large that they produce some kind of strange behavior. They're kind of just ordinary, nothing, nothing spectacular. Yeah, so I mean, of course, you can, re you can express this in different ways. You can use the semi-lattice rectum. Uh, yeah, I mean, the point was for a large eccentricity, this amplitude do does get large, but in the, in the numerical work, the initial result was much, much larger than that. So, but this really is the correct amplitude. So what other, con so this now led me to think that there may be other contexts in which these kinds of cross terms in, in post-Newtonian theory might be important. So the first is the problem of, um, uh, n-body equations of motion where you have a central black hole that is responsible for uh, possible relativistic effects. And the other uh, context is in the case of hierarchical triples. So in this context, what I mean by cross terms are, is this. So at Newtonian order, you have the acceleration, uh, say, due to the central black hole. Here, n would stand for the mass of the black hole. R is the distance of your star from the black hole. But of course, there are accelerations due to the other stars in the system governed by this parameter delta. Here delta then stands for the other stars. So these are the Newtonian accelerations. And post-Newtonian theory says that you modify these terms by dimensionless potentials, potentials divided by c squared. So one potential would be that of the black hole of your given star. 
And then another potential would be that due to uh, one of the other stars in the system, dimensionless post-Newtonian potential. So the kinds of cross terms I'm talking about are terms where you take the acceleration due to the black hole of a given star, and it's modified by a factor due to the relativistic potential of uh, one of the other stars in the system. And similarly, the acceleration uh, due toward one of the distant stars is modified by a factor due to the potential of the black hole. Now, the full n-body post-Newtonian equations of motion are, are known. They've been known since 1916, the work of Drost and uh, Lorentz. Uh, but they're also they're um, commonly called the Einstein and Feld Hoffman equations. Um, they also include, of course, terms that involve the acceleration toward another body modified by the relativistic potential of yet another body. Those terms I will uh, ignore in everything I say here. Um, in the, you might expect them to be very small in a big end body simulation with a central black hole. And of course, these are also three body interactions, which become uh, computationally expensive as the number of bodies grows. We'll see that these cross terms are still always just two body terms. So forgetting those terms, so basically truncating the n-body equations of motion and keeping just these kinds of cross terms, here's what you get. You get the standard Newtonian acceleration. One is the black hole, and big M is the mass of the black hole and then the acceleration due to the other bodies. You get the standard post-Newtonian corrections to the motion due to the black hole. And these are corrections that are typically put into n-body simulations. That's what Merritt et al. used in their n-body simulations. Um, and then these are the cross terms. So they all depend on 1 over c squared. They all depend on the mass either of the body itself. There are a few kind of self-acceleration terms. So these are called self-force terms in another context. And then on the mass of uh, one of the other bodies, but it's all, all two-body interactions, and it's proportional to the mass of the black hole. Here, V squared is also dominantly proportional to the mass of the black hole. So these are relatively simple terms that could be encoded in, into an n-body code, and there's a, I've written down a, a, an equivalent equation of motion for the black hole itself so that you can run a code that preserves, uh, conserves total momentum, linear momentum, to the appropriate order. So these could... Yeah. Um, I think they're, they, no, they don't use cross terms. They just use the standard post-Newtonian terms due to the sun. With the small exception of the Earth-Moon system where you, you include some terms like Nordvet effect and other things. I'm sorry? Well, for the solar system, it, uh, it, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I mean, hundreds. I don't know what the what's the, what is the upper limit on some of these simulations. I'm not, I'm not an expert. Yeah, sure. Tens, hundreds. Uh, does anybody go up to a thousand? Yeah. I mean, so there there are large numbers, thousands. So so as you can imagine, these uh, these terms then are no worse in in, a, in terms of coding than than the original two uh, two body interaction terms, but the three body terms have been truncated. So uh, David Merritt and his postdoc Gabor Kupi are investigating these terms and doing, trying to do some experiments to see whether or not you, know, you could find some interesting uh, new effects that these terms might generate. But as David always reminds me, every time you do something in an n-body simulation, you tweak any variable, all kinds of new stuff occurs. So it's, it's very, you have to be very careful designing an experiment that reveals an effect that you might be looking for. But anyway, this is ongoing work. Um, and I think in this in this case uh, in this case they're not. I think the planetary masses are so so small in that, this case that they're uh, they're just not not important. And and they're in regular orbits. I mean, it, I think these are. Uh, Yeah, but I've seen papers where that, that have worked out the Fokker Planck equations, including post-Newtonian corrections. But I think just these, these corrections, not cross terms. So another context where uh, I think these uh, things might be uh, interesting is the uh, hierarchical triple problem, the COSI problem. So here you have a binary system. This is not really to scale. It's meant to be a close binary system whose semi-major axis is small compared to the distance to a third body. 
And the, this, of course, has the famous property, the kozai lidoff mechanism, whereby the eccentricity can oscillate over very large values while the inclination similarly oscillates. The orbit sort of goes like this. I probably have the phasing wrong, but it, it becomes circular and eccentric as the orbit tilts back and forth. And the pericenter can uh, grow in an erratic fashion. It can go backwards and forwards. It can even, uh, there's a fixed point to this problem. And of course, this has very interesting implications, both in really the underlying mechanism for, uh, for the resonant relaxation has important implications for asteroids, planets, exoplanets, and so on. You can write down these cross terms in an exactly similar way. The Newtonian standard uh, COSI uh, uh, equations are shown here. Here, just expanded to quadrupole order in the external field, but you can go to higher order in principle. Here are the standard two-body post-Newtonian binary terms that are uh, easy to include. But then the cross terms here would be these. Again, all proportional to 1 over c squared and all proportional to the mass of the third body uh, in the end. So m3 over c squared, so that tells you it's a cross term, but they're all uh, shown there. So what are the consequences of these cross terms? This, of course, is a simpler problem. You can now solve it using standard orbital perturbation theory. So you write down the planetary equations, uh, take into account all the, the caveats I've described before. You plug in the perturbations, then solve the first order for both the COSI terms and the post-Newtonian terms, but then plug them back in because you're really looking for cross-term effects. It's conventional to average over the orbit of the third body, put it into a circular orbit and average over that orbit, although you can embellish that if you wish if you're looking for uh, more complicated effects. But what I've done is this simple average over uh, a circular third body orbit, and then integrate over the true anomaly from 0 to 2 pi to look for secular effects on the orbit elements. So omega has, as you would expect, three contributions, the post-Newtonian, COSI contribution, and then a cross term. Eccentricity and inclination, of course, are constant in uh, post-Newtonian theory. So there's only a COSI uh, effect and a cross term effect. And then again, as we saw in the quadrupole piece, A is constant in Newtonian theory with the COSI term, constant in post-Newtonian theory, but when you include the cross terms, there's a variation. If we just look at the COSI effect, uh, these are the equations. They have uh, the interesting property that there's a conserved quantity. The z component of the angular momentum of the two-body orbit is conserved. That makes sense because by averaging over the third body's circular orbit, you've basically smeared its mass into an axisymmetric ring. So by axisymmetry, there's got to be a conserved quantity in the z direction. So that just comes, falls right out of combining these two equations. There's an additional conserved uh, quantity uh, from combining these. It's a, to me, at least, is slightly more mysterious. I don't fully understand it. But this generates these wide oscillations in eccentricity. And of course, there's the famous stationary point. If uh, E and I have satisfy this critical equation, and omega is either pi by 2 or 3 pi by 2, there's a stationary point of the equations. And so in pure Newtonian theory, you get these large swings of eccentricity. Here I've chosen delta equals 10 to the minus 4. That's the COSI parameter, initial, initial inclination of 60 degrees, and uh, initial pericenter of 0. You get these large swings. But now when you turn on the binary pericenter precession due to general relativity, and this is just the binary part, that rapid, and it's rapid because I've chosen epsilon to be 10 times larger, that rapid precession of the pericenter basically quenches these oscillations in eccentricity. They don't have time to grow before the pericenter has moved into the other quadrant and the eccentricity d e d t turns around and drops down again. And so the eccentricity is quenched by the uh, post-Newtonian effects. And this is a well-known phenomenon that many people uh, have looked at before. Now what about including these cross terms? The result uh, is analytic. It's quite simple. Uh, for each of these uh, orbit elements, you get terms that depend on m3 and 1 over c squared. That tells you they're cross terms. And simple functions, well, not so simple, but they're known uh, analytic functions of E and eta. Eta is the dimensionless reduced mass parameter of the binary, m1, m2 over the mass squared. Uh, simple, just known functions of those, uh, algebraic functions of those parameters and simple dependence on the orbit elements. <coughs> 
So you could take these equations then and integrate them to find out what the evolution is and how that evolution might affect uh, the system. And of course, as I've already alluded to in, in the quadrupole conundrum, the big effect is on the conserved quantities. Once again, the energy uh, is conserved to this order. There's the Newtonian piece, the Kozai piece, the post-Newtonian piece, and then a very high order uh, cross-term piece, which won't be relevant. And again, if you did not include the cross-term variations in A, this variation in omega due to general relativity would kill the conservation of en energy. It's only when you include cross-term variations in A here and, as it turns out, also cosi variations in E in this post-Newtonian term that will generate cross-terms. The combination then conserves energy so that it really is constant, equal to its value at the initial values of all of these orbital elements. But without those cross-term variations in A, you would not get a conserved energy. Similarly, the angular momentum is equal to a Z component is this, but it does have a post-Newtonian correction. And once again, these variations in A uh, due to cross terms are needed to actually compensate for cosi variations in E here to make LZ conserved also. So you again get a, something that truly is constant even though uh, the, peri the pericenter of the binary is precessing. No, they depend on all these things, but of course, these now, the cross term share of order M3, 1 over C squared, and the variations in them are going to be of higher order and aren't going to act. Uh, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, they, they don't act back at this order. This one acts back, but the others won't. Now, what about uh, other aspects of the orbit? Do these cross terms make a, bi make a big difference? So you do some numerical uh, integrations. These are the same parameters as before. Here are the semi-major axis with, with just post-Newtonian precession, no cross terms is, is constant, but with the cross terms it oscillates uh, as, as you saw analytically, but there's a sort of one numerical example. But here's an example showing how energy and angular momentum are conserved. Uh, the, the, uh, their conservation is improved by including these cross terms. With just the post-Newtonian precession, these things both oscillate, but if you include the cross terms, the oscillations are suppressed by factor of 10. On the other hand, if you look at this uh, oscillation of the eccentricity with just the, the pericenter precession and now include the cross terms, you can't tell the difference. So these really are just, in this context, just small corrections uh, with out cross terms and with cross terms. The two are basically are, are the same and they're just a small deviation from the original thing. High order, like in uh, octopole, yeah. higher multiple order. Well, I mean, there you, like credit an octopole order, you get some very strange results, like spin flips, and all. Yeah. It, it's a very complicated result yeah. that would be interesting to look at. I just have not done that. Right. I, yeah, that would be something to, to think about. So, so the, the basic questions that this leaves are the following. It seems that including these cross terms in these, these dynamics does lead to improved conservation law behavior over these long pericenter precession timescales. The question is, do they have interesting astrophysical effects? And so one of my motivations is to just put out these, this kind of framework and formalism so that people who are really experts at doing the very efficient numerical integrations and exploring large regions, regions of parameter space can look and see if there are any interesting astrophysical effects that they might generate. I'm fully aware, of course, that people who work in uh, the COSI problem often use the language of uh, Delaunay variables and a Hamiltonian approach. Uh, those equations I've shown also can be written as a Hamiltonian system. Uh, and, um, and so one could, in principle, work this all out in terms of those kinds of variables. One question I have, of course, I often see in these, the papers I've looked at with these Delaunay methods is that you average over a short time scale and then look at the secular evolution of the Delaunay variables. Well, the question is, I've, I think I've demonstrated this averaging over short time scales can be tricky if you're looking for, uh, to include post-Newtonian terms that involve these cross-term effects. So uh, that's something that, that may be worth looking at. How does one do this averaging in these kinds of methods if you really are looking for uh, the effects of cross-term post-Newtonian effects. 
Um, and these are, this is some, just some future work that, uh, that, that I'm uh, working on. The, again, these simulations with David Merritt. And then also looking at cross terms in models of uh, galactic centers where you smooth out the distribution of matter and model uh, that field by various kinds of axisymmetric or triaxial potentials. The same framework can be applied to that kind of dynamics as well. So the final remark I want to make is a, a cautionary tale and a, a mea culpa. This is like a full disclosure announcement directed in some sense at the younger uh, people in the audience, postdocs and graduate students, but even directed at senior people because this mea culpa is on me. And so I'm a senior person, so I have to. When I first uh, derived these equations, the equations, uh, the cross terms, say for E and I, did not look like this. This is what I've shown you. There was an additional term in these equations, one here and a similar extra term for the uh, inclination. When I did the numerical integrations of these equations, it turned out that the eccentricity generically was damped exponentially on an admittedly fairly long time scale, but it did not just oscillate the way I showed. It was exponentially damped. So I got very excited. Anybody who does post-Newtonian theory, if you can find a way where general relativity produces a big effect, you get really excited. But I decided to be careful, and I wrote this all up and then set it around to a few experts in the field, like Scott and uh, Ben C. Coxis and David Merritt and Paul Alexander and a few others just for a sanity check. And the key point was made by Scott and Ben Say. They pointed out that this term does not satisfy time reversal invariance. The equations of motion are time reversal invariant. There's no gravitational radiation reaction in these equations. It's just first post-Newtonian theory, so it must be time reversal invariance. Turning T into minus T in induces a specific transformation of the orbital elements uh, uh, the, uh, that of the orientation of the orbit, because these are all defined by basically X and V. So if you let T go to minus T, omega and I and, and uh, big omega go to various things by adding and subtracting pi. And when you do those transformations, this term does not have the right transformation property. And it turns out, after looking uh, carefully, this is the term that leads to the exponential decrease in eccentricity. If you turn this off, you don't get it. If it's there, you get it. But I thought I had a counter argument to this, because it turns out that looking carefully, this term uh, and the key term that leads to the eccentricity comes from when you plug in that first order solution back into the Lagrange planetary equation. And in particular, when you plug in the the secular growth of the orbital element and plug that in. And I argue that by choosing that secular growth to be positive in terms of, of time or, or f, you were choosing a direction of time. If I chose the opposite direction, the secular growth would be in the opposite direction, and I'd get the opposite sign as you need to get. So I thought I had an answer. But then that got me to worrying about this whole idea of plugging, how do you plug back in the first order solution? And it rang a bell that somehow way back in the distant past when I used to read the unreadable books on celestial mechanics like Brower and Clements and others, but there was some issue about you know, separating secular and periodic effects. So it got me worried enough that I went back and did a full, uh, a really careful two time scale analysis of the original uh, Lagrange planetary equations, analysis that you can pull directly out of Carl Bender and Stephen Orzog's book on applied mathematics. I mean, it's a, a classic method in, uh, these kinds of two time scale problems, but it gives you a very rigorous way to tell what of these first order terms to plug in. And you really have to plug in only the periodic term. And when you do this carefully, that term disappears. A slightly less rigorous to see that it's really an irrelevant term, has nothing to do with the problem, is to notice that if I go back to the leading cosi term and simply shift omega by a constant factor, and this is constant to this order of approximation, just shift omega a little bit, I can absorb this term into a, a, a trivially redefined omega. Now you might say, why is this shift by half the pericenter position? It's six pi and not three pi, is it half? Well, it's because I've er I erroneously put f back in and integrated once, that gives, gives me f squared over two, the factor of two comes from that. So this is a, a less rigorous way of really explaining that I just really made a mistake and a really careful analysis shows that that term is not there. 
So the terms I showed earlier, these are the correct terms. They lead to oscillatory behavior. But the conservation of energy still holds exactly as I described with these equations of motion. But I say all this because there's a moral to the story. If you're not smart enough to get it right, you should at least be smart enough to ask really smart people for advice before making a fool of yourself. So that's both for young and old. That's a good lesson for all of us, especially me. Anyway, so but I tried to show that uh, um, in some contexts, it may be uh, useful to include certain kinds of post-Newtonian relativistic corrections in n-body dynamics that uh, haven't been really studied before. Whether or not they have important astrophysical consequences remains to be seen, but they do seem to at least uh, produce better behavior in terms of conserved quantities in these uh, dynamical systems. Thank you. Thank you.